Okay, welcome back. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, uh, as you saw on the previous screen, I do have everybody's microphones muted and there's a bunch of people on the call. So I do ask you to keep them that way um, for the uh, duration of the call. Um, you can use the, the tech chat box, excuse me, to type in any questions that you have as we go along. And I'll be stopping a couple times throughout uh, the presentation so that you can, um, I can look through those questions and see what people are asking um, and, and have, a, have, you, have a chance to have your questions answered. So please feel free to use that chat box as we're going through. And um, with that, we're gonna get started. So welcome again, um, for those who are new, and haven't joined us before or may not be as familiar with who we are, I just want to take a minute to talk about Wissahick and Trails. Uh, we are an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania, um, founded a little over 60 years ago to protect the land and water of the Wissahick and Creek. Um, we operate largely in Montgomery County with partners in Philadelphia County since Wissahickon drains into Philadelphia. Um, but to date, uh, in our part of Montgomery County, we've saved nearly 1,300 acres of land from development and on that land, we have 12 nature preserves and 25, 24 miles of trails that are open um, for you to visit. And you, we have a lot of other work going on in the area in terms of conservation and programming and um, those kinds of things. So please um, take a look at our website for a little bit more details on the um, work that we're doing uh, within the area and also to consider becoming a supporter. Since we are a nonprofit organization, we really do rely on our supporters uh, to help us continue our mission. And uh, we would love to have you join us in a, as a supporter. And if there are any current supporters on the call tonight, thank you, a uh, personal thank you from me. Um, your generous donations are what allow us to continue to do our work. So with that, we're going to dive into migration and start right at the beginning and talk about what it is. And really, very simply, it is a seasonal movement of animals from one region to another. Um, it generally includes, and really truly to be migration, needs to include a departure and a return to the same region. Um, a variety of animals migrate. Whales migrate. Um, whales migrate south in the fall um, and winter towards warmer, more protected areas um, for calving to have their babies. And then they move north in the spring and summer um, to areas that have abundant food. And they continue that cycle every year. American bison, um, herds of bison used to move from north to south in the fall through the middle of the country in the prairie grasslands. Part of the reason that the prairie grasslands stayed prairie grasslands and didn't become forests was because of the buffalo or the bison uh, moving through them in migration and it just didn't give trees a chance to grow. So they would follow the, the growth of grass north in the spring and kind of had circular routes of 200 to 400 miles depending on the individual herds of animals. Um, today, Bison still do migrate. Uh, there are wild herds in Yellowstone and they migrate um, to various parts of the park and even out of the park um, during some times of the year. And other mammals also migrate. Elk, mule deer, doll sheep um, that we all have, that we have here in North America all still migrate. Uh, caribou in Alaska uh, migrate between summer and wintering ranges that are about 400 miles apart. So not an insignificant journey uh, in Alaska. And their summer range has nutrient, nutritious food that helps their calves grow, kind of like the whales as well. Um, and everybody gets fat and healthy before the winter to help them survive. Uh, but that summer range is a harsh and windy place in the winter. So they move to a different region where the weather, the food, the snow cover are more agreeable for them. And oops, forgot the caribou. Sorry, caribou picture. Um, insects even migrate. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, insects specifically um, at the end of presentation today. So monarchs are the example here, uh, but other species of butterflies do migrate as well. And dragonflies are another example of an insect that migrates. So um, most journeys for migration are quick. They move one fall or winter and the following spring, they're moving back to where they started. Um, some migration journeys take multiple years, like salmon, for example. They spend um, a couple of years actually as small salmon in their stream where they're born before they migrate to the ocean. 
And once they're in the ocean, they can stay there for several years before as an adult, they'll migrate back to that stream to breed. So their migration journey happens over um, a whole lot of years compared to most animals that do it sort of in one, even if it's not a calendar year um, as we think of it. So a little bit different strategies that um, everybody has. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to really focus on birds and kind of do a deep dive on birds. And mostly the reason that we're going to do this is because you can see there's a lot of animals that migrate. But and mammal migrations, don't get me wrong, they could be spectacular just from the sheer numbers of animals that could be migrating. Wildebeest migrations in Africa have hundreds of thousands of animals. Bison migrations of old times could have 4 million animals moving at once. Quite a spectacular scene if you can see that. But realistically, they're also kind of mundane. They can only walk. So they walk from one place to another and then they walk back. And it's not actually particularly exciting to just walk from one place to another in my mind. Birds on the other hand, have some pretty amazing adaptations that allow for some absurdly long migratory routes. And we're going to talk about that um, as we go through tonight. So birds that nest in the northern hemisphere where we live, United States, Canada, tend to migrate northward in the spring to take advantage of, bird, of insect populations, uh, budding plants, and an abundance of nesting locations. As winter approaches, they go back south. And then I will say up front, escaping the cold is a motivating factor. Um, but many species of birds, including hummingbirds, actually can survive freezing temperatures as long as they have an adequate supply of food and water uh, in most cases. Um, and it's, so it's really that available, availability of food that drives uh, the migration. And we're going to start with a journey of epic proportions. This is a red knot. Um, for those who are not familiar, this is a medium size-ish sandpiper. It's about 10 inches long. It weighs about four ounces, so about as much as a quarter pound hamburger. Um, it's not that big. It's not that heavy. This bird breeds in the Canadian Arctic and winters at the very tip of South America. And every year it makes an epic round trip journey that is about 18,000 miles, some of which occurs in nonstop flight over the Atlantic Ocean. How is this even possible? And that's what we're going to dig into right now. Because that's a pretty fantastic trip for a small bird to be making. And birds really at the heart of it are built to migrate. First and foremost, they have wings. Um, it allows them to fly. It allows them to move in a way that terrestrial animals just can't and cover those longer distance distances in a much more efficient fashion. Um, because they have wings, they have, and the ability to fly, they, along with that, they have lightweight sort of hollowish bones um, that allow them to have a lightweight but very sturdy skeleton. Again, if they had a bones like ours, it would be difficult to get off the ground and actually fly. Um, flying comes with a downside though, because it, it takes a lot of energy to supply um, the metabolic demands of flight. So to go along with that, they also have super efficient circulatory and respiratory systems. So birds have a four chambered heart, just like we do. And it pretty much works exactly like ours does. The only difference is, is that proportionately for their size, their hearts weigh about six times more than a human heart comparatively. Um, they also have very rapid heartbeats. So most birds have a resting heart rate that's around 500 beats per minute um, for a small songbird. Hummingbirds can actually have a resting um, heart rate of 1,000 beats per minute. Um, humans are under 100 most of the time for resting heart rate. And this very rapid heart rate allows for very rapid circulation of blood. So it gets blood and oxygen to all of the tissues that need it to help sustain those flight movements um, and supply those muscles with oxygen. Birds have two lungs, just like we do. Um, but in addition, so on this picture, you can forget about the words. I couldn't find a good picture without all the words, but the pink um, globs here are the lungs. And so they have two of them, just like we do. But in addition to their lungs, they also have air sacs. 
and the whole volume of the bird's respiratory system takes up about 20% of their volume. Um, in humans, our respiratory system takes up about 5% of our overall volume. So you can see they dedicate a lot of space uh, to this circulatory system. And the reason is because they need to get that oxygenated blood to all of the tissues that need to support their flight or otherwise they wouldn't be able to fly. In our system, when we breathe in and breathe out, air goes basically in and out the same set of tubes in our, in our body. We have small alveoli in our, in our lungs that the air goes into and basically circles around and comes back out. Birds, on the other hand, have a much more efficient sort of one-way system, and that's how they use the air sacs. The air sacs basically allow the bird to pump air across the lung, through the lung surface, one way. And it just makes for a much more efficient oxygen transfer. Because basically, as the blood's going through those lungs, it's collecting oxygen along the way um, the whole time versus our sort of dead end system that air has to come back out. Uh, and it just makes it much more efficient um, in terms of their oxygen transfer. This kind of a system also allows birds to regulate their temperature. Uh, birds don't sweat like we do. They pant like dogs actually when they're hot, but flight and sustained flight when they're flapping their wings constantly actually generates a lot of heat. And this air system and circulatory system that they have actually allows them to dissipate that heat as they're flying, which is another really important thing. If you're gonna take a migratory journey that's 18,000 miles and you're gonna to have to fly the whole way. Um, in birds that migrate, wings tend to be longer and pointier than those that don't migrate. Now, and again, there's a lot of crossover here um, because a lot of birds that migrate have different shaped wings, even though they all migrate, uh, and it's largely species specific. But in general, um, birds that do migrate tend to have longer, more pointier wings than those that don't. In addition, the pectoral muscles across the chest are also um, larger and especially uh, developed for extremely efficient energy production and use. Um, and so because those are the muscles that tend to control flight and that are used um, very heavily when a bird might be migrating for a long distance. In addition, they also have um, specialized adaptations in their blood that allow for oxygen levels, um, for low oxygen levels if they're flying at higher altitudes. So again, all things that really designed, their system is designed to allow them, um, in addition to just simply flying, to actually make these very long distance journeys. The other thing that birds do is they prepare for migration by increasing calories and depositing fat in their bodies. And because birds have transparent skin, you, we can actually see that fat. So this is a bird, and I apologize, I'm not actually sure which bird this is because I got this from another banding sites um, pictures. The belly of the bird is here, the feathers are pushed out of the way and you can see it's this pink sort of transparent skin. Um, there's really nothing there in the picture on the left. In the picture on the right, you can see this bubble of yellow fat, literally that's been laid down. Um, and that fat is really important to provide uh, energy during migration because as you can imagine, if you're traveling 18,000 miles and part of that is over the open ocean, there's not many places for a bird to stop and eat. And so having that fat laid down in their system and having then a system that allows them to very efficiently use fat for energy, which is kind of unique. Um, it's actually very difficult for us to use as humans to use fat as energy. Our bodies don't really want to do that. That's why we store it. We would rather use carbohydrates. Um, the pathway to break those down and use them for energy is much easier than that for fat. And in birds, their fat metabolism is extremely efficient. And again, designed to migrate. Um, and in addition, they have the ability to be able to uh, sort of I want to say grow and shrink. That's not really what they're doing. They're allowing organs that they're not really going to be using very much, like their sex organs, for example. They kind of go dormant during migration. Um, they can, some birds that, build, that migrate long, long distances can actually 
expand their digestive system to allow them to put all that fat on their body, then once they have the fat and they start migrating, they can actually decrease the size of their digestive organs because they're not going to be using them for a while. They have the fat in their body already. So some unique adaptations that way that allow them um, for, to, to take these epic journeys. So let's talk about getting there for a second. So in order to be able to migrate, a bird has to know where to go, they have to know when to go, and they have to know how to get there. So we're gonna take a sort of deeper dive into all three of these areas. And we're gonna start with when to go. So the mechanisms that in initiate migratory behavior are not completely understood. I'm gonna say that right now. Um, but in general, there's kind of three things that sort of take priority. One is a combination of changes in day length and temperature. So if you think about a bird that's in Canada in September, the days start getting shorter and the temperature starts dropping. Excuse me. And the reverse is true for a bird that might be wintering in Costa Rica. There is um, a little bit of a day length increase and a little bit of a temperature increase. Now, usually in the tropics, it's not as much of a change in daylight, day length and temperature um, because they're closer to the equator than it is, say, in northern Canada. Um, but it is those changes in day length and temperature that can sort of kick things off a little bit. Changes in food supply. So for songbirds, um, a lot of them eat insects and a lot of them, that's all they eat is insects. And so uh, if it's cold and insect populations aren't around and they're dying and there's just not as much food, then that's gonna be a trigger um, to say, hey, I need to get out of Dodge and go someplace that I can find more food. Um, for ducks and geese and things like that, waterfowl, um, freezing of ponds and lakes can also, you know, covers over their food supply. And those kinds of things can trigger them to migrate. The biggest one though, really, is genetic predisposition. Birds literally have the ability to migrate written into their genes. And how it's written into their genes differs across species. Some species are what we call obligate, obligate migrants. They always move. Every year, they do it about the same time kind of regardless of the weather, but we'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. In a bit. But so this includes like in our area, the majority of all of our insect eating songbirds like warblers, flycatchers, vireos, orioles, they all leave all the time every year. Other species are what we call facultative migrants. They're a little bit more flexible in their timing. Um, for example, some ducks and geese, they might not move if their local weather is okay and the ponds are open and they can find food in the ponds. They're good, they might not move. First freeze over, they'll move to some place where they can find open water. And a few other species, um, we're gonna talk about the blue jay in a little bit, but that's another sort of facultative migrant as well as the American robin. Um, we all think of robins as a sign of spring, but in fact, my, robins don't actually migrate as much as we think they do. And part of that is as long as they can find food, they're happy. Um, so we're going to look a little bit deeper into the idea of timing, and we're going to use some eBird data um, on warblers from Fort Washington State Park. So for those who might not be familiar with eBird, um, it is a real-time database that birders use to collect observations when they're out birding, and it includes information on the date, the time, um, the location, how far they traveled, how many people were observing, and the number of each species of bird that they see, ideally. Um, because this system exists, data over multiple years and multiple observers can be summarized in a variety of different ways. We're going to look at two of them tonight. The first is these bar charts, and these bar charts are created within the system um, for a specific location. So this is a part of the bar chart for Fort Washington State Park. And you can see it goes over a year, January to December. And the way that this works is this is not actually numbers of birds for this graph. It's actually um, the percentage of the time that somebody sees. It's basically your chances of seeing the bird. So it's based on the number of 
observations that come in of that bird at that location at that time of the year. But one of the things that it does is because more a higher chance of seeing the bird at that time of the year often has to do with how many of those birds are around. And when there's more of them, people have a higher chance of seeing them. So the bigger the bar, the higher the chance of seeing them. If we look at the middle of the chart here, this American Red Start, we can see it sort of starts to arrive in our area in late April, fourth week of April. Uh, it starts picking up a little bit in May, the first week of May, the bar gets a little bit bigger, then we have the biggest bar in the second week of May, and then there's still birds around, but it's starting to drop off. And then they're really not seen really very much in June or July, and the numbers start to pick back up at the late end of July into August, September, and October, and even into October. And so we can kind of get a sense that um, this is the time of the year in May and spring that they're really going to be here. And if you kind of look down this chart at the second week of May, so the second bar in, for almost all of these species, that's like the biggest bar consistently, that second week of May. And some species are spread over a little bit more time. Uh, yellow warblers actually breed here, so that's why we see them much later into June and July than the other species. Um, common yellow throats also breed here. But you get a sense of the, the peak of migration, really sort of being that second week of May, most pretty consistently uh, across most of these species. Fall migration, so spring's very short in terms of timing. And, and that actually makes sense because there is really a biological imperative uh, in the birds in the spring to get to the breeding grounds as soon as they possibly can. And it's a timing game that they're playing because they want to make sure that they're getting there uh, so that they can early enough to, to claim the best territory. Um, but they don't want to get there too early uh, before there's insects to eat, for example. All of these warblers are insect eaters. And so they need the trees to be leaving out and they need it warm enough that the insects are starting to move so that they have food when they get there. So it's a balancing act. In the fall, however, that biological imperative is not there. They don't need to breed. They don't need to worry about breeding. They don't need to worry about finding a mate until the next spring. So they're a lot more leisurely in the fall. So actually, the fall is actually a really good time to see a lot better migration because it's protracted over a longer period of time. The birds are a little bit more relaxed. They hang around a little bit longer. If they're in an area that's got a lot of food, they may stay there for a couple of days waiting for ideal weather, you know, adding more fat, getting ready for that, you know, big push um, for the next stage of their migration. So fall's a lot more protracted. And if we look at another quick set of data for um, some other common species, and I really am sort of pointing out four common ones on here, the blue jay, the American crow, the Carolina chickadee, and the tufted titmouse. These kind of bar charts look like the birds never migrate. And to some extent, that's kind of true. Um, but we have additional data that actually lets us see that there is actually migration going on in some of these species that are here all year round. So when we talk about where to go, um, that is one of the things that is hardwired into most migrant species of birds. And the specifics of each species migration strategies have evolved over a lot of years. Uh, and it's still changing today for some species. House finches across most of the country uh, don't migrate, but house finches actually spread into the Northeast over the last, I don't even know how long, a number of years, say 50 to 100 years. And, and they've been spreading their range across to cover the entire United States. And the population in the Northeast part of the United States, um, New England, basically, and those birds now migrate. Uh, where they didn't used to migrate at all before because they weren't there. But the winter is just a little bit too harsh for them to survive in New England. So they'll migrate um, a little bit further south uh, to, they're not making epic migrations to um, Costa Rica or uh, Colombia, but they are definitely getting out of uh, New England. And so those things are really hardwired into each species. 
And we're not going to go into a lot of the specifics here in terms of sort of the evolutionary history of, of birds and how they got to where they are. Um, that would be a whole presentation in and of itself. But I'm going to show you a couple examples that sort of talk through some of the different migration strategies that we see between species. So starting with one of the common birds in our area, the blue jays. And most of us probably really do see this bird all year long, especially if we have feeders in our yard. Um, they're very common. And on the surface, it seems like they don't migrate. And that might actually be true for parts of the population, but there are parts of it that actually do move. And we can see this again using eBird data and the good folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology who run eBird have started putting together these abundance maps. And you remember when I said eBird, birders using eBird, one of the things that they should be putting in is the number of birds that they're seeing. And so these wonderful statistics people at Cornell have been able to take all of that data and create these maps. And so I'm, this actually is an animated map and I'm gonna play it for you once real quick and then we'll sort of talk through it. So it's starting in January of a year and it's moving through until December. So you can see that there are actually movements of blue jays. Now, some of this, I'm gonna start this over from the beginning. Um, we see, you know, they're spread across a lot of their range in the winter. They're here. Um, the relative abundance, max numbers of birds that are being seen at any point in time or, you know, where these dark purple bars are is about seven and a half birds. I don't know how you get a half a bird, but it's an average. So um, bear with it. But, you know, seven birds is a decent number um, to be seen, you know, even up into parts of Canada and New England in January and February. So they're there. Um, we see some sort of shifts. We see, you know, they're moving a little bit around. This may be a little bit of territory hunting. It may be that food sources disappeared in a local region, and so they moved a little bit. Um, we see probably these big purple, dark purple areas are birds that were a little bit further south that are now moving back north um, as we're getting into April and May, uh, as we get into the breeding season. Now this lull that we kind of see in June and July, we have a few pockets of higher levels of birds. This is very common during the breeding season. Birds get quiet. They're focused on raising their young. Um, they're not spending time, as much time defending territories. They already have the territory. They have a nest, they have babies, they have to take care of it. So we often don't encounter as many birds of any species when we go out um, sort of in the middle of that breeding season in June, July uh, and into the beginning of August. But then you'll notice what we do see is, uh, I knew this was gonna do this, sorry, hold on a second. These charts think I want to click to the next page or PowerPoint thinks I want to click to the next page when I just want to play the chart. What we see in, um, let me let this go. What we see in August and September and these really pronounced numbers of birds here, oh, it did it again. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that's young of the year. The population of blue jays has just increased several fold from all of the young that have come out of the nest. And so you kind of see that with that deep purple flush um, over the, uh, the range of the birds. The next one that I want to show you real quick is the catbird. This is another very common gray catbird, very common bird in our area. And generally speaking, we think of these birds as completely migrating out of the region. We tend to not see them until um, the next spring, once they're gone in the fall. And you can see even here before I start playing this, there is, I mean, 0.16. It's a very low number, excuse me, but along the East Coast, even up into um, parts of New England, there are catbirds being seen even in January. But by and large, the vast majority of them are down in Florida, a few on some Caribbean islands, and down into Central America. So I'm going to play this animation for you. And 
This is a much more dramatic one than, so now they're back in their range, breeding and migrating. And one of the interesting things about catbirds is that you see that there's a wide variety of locales that they winter in. And researchers have actually used um, both banding data, so capturing the birds and marking them with bands, and then they usually take a blood sample from them. And that DNA analysis that they've done actually showed them that different populations of catbirds migrate to different places. So the catbirds that we have here in Pennsylvania are actually most likely to be in Florida or maybe in Cuba um, over the winter. But catbirds that breed sort of more in the Midwest and the central part of the, the country are actually more likely to fly to um, South America or Central America for their migration. So they have slightly different population uh, dynamics depending on where they live. And the other interesting thing about this is um, catbirds that are hanging around in our area in the winter. And again, as I said, there's not very many of them, but they're here. Um, this is an example potentially of a risk benefit strategy that birds can show related to migration. So those birds that stay further north they're taking a risk that they will be able to find food all winter. Catbirds eat a variety of food. They eat insects, but they can also eat berries and seeds. Um, they'll, I've, I've had one come to suet at a feeder uh, in very early spring. So they eat a variety of things and they can find food in a variety of places. So it, that staying north might actually be a risk worth taking, um, provided they survive the winter, they're in a much better position then to claim good breeding territories uh, in the spring. And it's possible that warming trends that we see overall um, from climate change could lead to some of these birds staying further north and sort of changing the migratory patterns over a number of years. Researchers have shown um, from some birds in Europe that if they take a population of the birds that are long distance migrants from one region and a population of birds, same species of birds, one's long distance migrants, one's short distance migrants from different areas, they end up crossbreeding them and they get middle range migrants. So those um, changes in migration can actually be bred into birds over time. And so we may see, you know, in 10 or 20 years, um, this number of cat birds staying much higher uh, in the winter in our area uh, because they've decided it's not worth the effort uh, to migrate and they don't need to. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what this, what this uh, animation looks like in several years. The next one I wanna talk about really quickly is the orchard oriole. Um, this is a bird that completely, it does breed here. This completely leaves North America um, during the winter, uh, as you can see. And so it has a slightly different strategy uh, in terms of its migra migration. So you can see it has a pretty wide breeding range, but it has a fairly concentrated wintering range. And this is showing sort of a lot of connectivity between its breeding and wintering grounds. Um, since this bird has a wide breeding range, it's not likely to be particularly threatened by an event that happens on the breeding ground. It could be threatened by an event that happens on its wintering ground because a large number of the population is there. And some species of birds may um, breed in a very, very small area comparatively, and then also winter in a very small area. And we say that has a high level of connectivity between breeding and wintering grounds. And events, major events, either weather events or um, destruction of habitat or something else that impacts the level of resources that they have means that those birds may no longer be able to survive uh, and it could significantly impact their population. Oops, sorry. The last one that I wanted to show you, this is another one that has um, a migratory strategy that has two different paths. Spring is really different um, from winter. So um, again, we're starting down here, uh, way into South America is where these birds winter. And as we start getting into April and May, you see they start moving north through the middle of the country up into the Arctic when they breed. And wait, where'd they go? There's, they didn't come back down the middle of the country. These birds actually 
um, come down the east coast out over the water and come straight down into um, their wintering grounds in South America. So employ an entirely different, basically different strategy um, for spring migration versus fall migration. And for birders, it's unlikely to see a white rum sandpiper on the east coast. You can, but they're not common in the springtime. They're much more common in the fall. Um, so again, uh, an interesting way of dealing with um, prevailing winds, weather systems, stopover points, all of these kinds of things. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these uh, moving forward, but all of these kinds of things impact um, how birds migrate uh, and where they migrate to. So last but not least, oops, let's check back in with our red knot. So I have to admit that this is a really difficult animation to see because of the scale of the map. Uh, so I apologize, you're going to kind of have to look carefully because you can see that the, num the, the colors are really, really light um, just because we're looking at a range that goes from the Arctic down to the bottom of Central America or South America, sorry. So um, let me play this for you and just kind of keep your eyes on the edges of the continents, if you will, because that's where the birds mostly end up. until they hit their breeding grounds. I'm gonna play that one more time because I know it's difficult to see. And the other part that makes it difficult for these birds, you'll notice it says the, the dark gray regions, no prediction. And that's because mostly there's not people up there birding. So there's just not enough data um, to be able to know what the abundance of those birds is uh, at any given point in time. Um, the rainforest in Brazil is very difficult to bird. And it's not, there are a lot of areas that are birded, but there's a lot of it that's not birded consistently enough to be able to have data to make predictions. But one thing, I'm gonna go till May you'll notice oh, again. Oh, sorry these birds have so part of the reason why that range is so big for the red knots is there's actually a number of different subspecies and almost each one of those subspecies uses its own strategy for migration so birds from the west coast do one thing birds more on the east coast do another thing and so that's why it's also really difficult and the birds look like they're very spread out over those continents because they actually are um, in terms of their migratory strategies but we're going to talk about the subspecies that we can see here not like in the watershed where we're operating uh, as Wissahickon Trails, but in our larger general region, um, largely along the Delaware Bay shore. And so again, we're back to our red knot. And this is a bird that this subspecies of this bird has perfected its timing of its migration for resource utilization. So again, we're coming from very tip bottom down here of South America, and we're going up to the Arctic to breed. And on the way by the Delaware Bay, this is where we stop. These birds, generally speaking, sort of have two stopping points on this massive migratory route that they're doing. One at the edge of Brazil along the coast uh, to fuel up one more time before they fly over the ocean. And then they come down in the Delaware Bay. And why do they come down in the Delaware Bay? They come because of the horseshoe crabs. These are horseshoe crabs, they're laying, um, each female, each spring, they, they migrate from the open ocean into shallow coastal waters to lay their eggs in the sand. Each female lays 60,000 to 120,000 eggs. Um, they, these eggs are a bounty of protein rich goodness for the red knots and all of the other birds that join them. Uh, so ready turnstones, uh, laughing gulls, Semi-palmated sandpipers, um, sanderlings, those are usually the main characters on the beach, but there may be a few others in there. Um, but it's really the red knots that have their migration timed to this stopover point for this food source. These other birds, they partake of it, um, but they're not really 
dependent on it the way that the red knots are to fuel up. And so these birds literally, I mean, they're out of gas by the time they get to the Delaware Bay. So they need this food if they're gonna continue their journey. And they stay in the area for a very short period of time, fueling up on those eggs before they do the last leg of their journey again, which they normally do nonstop um, until they get to their breeding grounds. So one of the issues, because they're so highly connected to this stopover point, is that if something happens to the horseshoe crabs, it's really bad for the birds. And horseshoe crabs uh, in the area have been overfished um, for a couple of different reasons. They're used uh, as a bait, as bait for a couple of other different kinds of fisheries. Um, they can, their blood is collected for use in biomedical applications, and this overfishing and overharvesting of horseshoe crabs has led to a decline in their numbers and subsequently a decline in red knots. Now, there's probably other factors besides just the horseshoe crab decline because there's probably also issues on their wintering grounds in terms of resources, but the lack of horseshoe crab eggs doesn't help the situation. Now, um, we, you know, a lot of people working in conservation realize this, notice the changes, notice the declines in the number of red knots that were being seen. You can see this bird here. I took this picture on the Delaware Bay shore um, this actually this past summer, and you can see it's tagged. Uh, it has both a metal uh, USGS bird band, and then it also has this flag tag. Um, I have another picture of it that has the better. You can actually report the number. This bird was actually tagged in New Jersey, um, but these birds are highly studied uh, because of the declines in their numbers and trying to um, preserve the species and preserve this sort of unique uh, ecological uh, phenomenon that happens in the Delaware Bay shore every May. Um, and if you're not a birder and want to see it, um, I can tell you where to go. Shoot me an email. If you are a birder and you've never seen it and want to see it, let me know and I can tell you where to go. Um, because it's, it's a really cool thing to see the beach just absolutely covered with birds um, and, and feasting on uh, the eggs and, and the horseshoe crabs crawling up and down the beach. It's, it's an awesome scene. So I'm going to stop here for questions. Um, let's see if we've got any questions. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat now, but again, please feel free to ask them if you think of what. So the other thing that I said they have to do is know how to get there. So how to know where they're going. Um, and in order to find a way, birds or any other animal that migrates and even people that don't migrate, um, we need a couple of things. Uh, we need a compass, we need a map, um, an internal clock helps not necessarily as much of an issue for humans since we can read a clock, uh, but for birds and animals, some kind of internal clock that helps them um, coordinate with time-based phenomenon, like stars moving across the sky, those kinds of things. And all of those things are important to um, navigate to a location. And I wish I could give you an example of really how exactly these things work in birds because they all have varying levels of all of these things. The problem is, is that we just really don't know all of the answers. Um, and what we really have to do is come back to the gen genetics here. It is just hardwired into birds and it's hardwired into birds into different species in different ways, as we've seen from the different migration some strategies that different species have. Their wiring is a little bit different, um, but they have internal compasses that can help them determine directions from the sun's position during the day, um, from star patterns at night. Uh, they can also read the Earth's magnetic field to help them figure out where they are and where they need to get to. And they also can get information from the position of the setting sun, from physical landmarks that they might see along the way. Um, and there's also some evidence that sense of smell plays a role. Um, homing, pige homing pigeons have been the ones that have shown that the most, but it's possible that it might be prevalent in other birds as well, that sense of smell may play a role. Um, the problem is birds are difficult to study and we have a lot of different ways to study them, but it's very hard to make sure that you catch the same bird all the time. Um, there are things that can be done to sort of increase the odds of that, but 
it is difficult. And so that's why a lot of this, we know the basics of it. Yes, they have a compass. How it exactly works, all those details aren't quite known yet. But there is a lot of research going on in this area. Um, one of the things that's helping researchers understand this a little bit better and how birds utilize resources as they stop over, like the red knots do in the Delaware Bay, is the advent of very small little transmitters that can be put onto birds. And they use towers that are set up along the way. And basically every time a bird flies past the tower, a data point gets registered. And so it allows researchers to track a bird over a much longer distance. It used to be that you had to put a transmitter on a bird and then you literally had to get in a car and try to follow it. And you can imagine that doesn't work very well um, over very long distances and certainly not if they're crossing over open water and things like that. So migratory research has a lot of things that have been studied and that we know fairly well, but there's still a lot of those details that are being researched um, as we do. So again, as I said, they can use the sun, they can use the stars, they can use the Earth's magnetic fields. Um, so all of these things are the internal systems that are just wired into the bird um, to get them to their wintering grounds and back to their breeding system, breeding grounds. There is also evidence I should mention that birds can learn. So a lot of birds, um, while they're doing their first migration, they may go off course a lot. They may not end up in the right place to begin with. Um, they may not have a good sense of exactly where they're going that first time because most of them are not doing it with parents. They're doing it by themselves. Those young that were just born in July or August and now in September and October, they're flying south for the winter. Those birds um, sometimes make mistakes but can actually learn uh, the route better in subsequent years and um, learn where to uh, stop over, all of those kinds of things. So there, there is evidence that while it's a lot of it is hardwired, there can be learning that enhances uh, that hardwiring. One of the things that birds have to decide is whether or not, or not really decide, because it's hardwired into them, but they have, do they fly during the day or do they fly at night? And in actuality, the vast majority of birds fly at night. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. It's generally cooler. Um, the air is calmer when the sun's down, when the sun is up. There's a lot of heat that rises um, off of the ground and creates currents up in the air. That makes it more difficult for, for birds, a lot of small birds to fly. Um, there may be less predators and less chance of a predator um, you know, grabbing them for dinner. And then, you know, if they migrate at night, then they have an opportunity to stop over someplace, feed, rest a little bit um, for a day, maybe two days, depending on the weather, uh, and then continue on to their, their journey. So most birds are not doing these sort of long epic migrations uh, like the red knot does, for example. They're doing shorter hops. Some species have very long hops um, built into that, but a lot of them are doing sort of much shorter hops uh, along the migratory path. And that's why those stopover locations are really important. So birds at night, interestingly enough, can actually be seen on radar. So I am gonna play this animation for you. Um, this is October 2nd, 2008, I think it is. Um, it's hard to see the time um, when this starts, but uh, you'll kind of see this peak, which is about two hours after sunset. Um, and all, before I even play, all of these blue splotches, those are birds. So take a look here and see what happens. So this is three o'clock in the afternoon. Now we're at 5.30, 6.30, 7.00. Eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. And those are all birds flying, even at midnight, they're still flying. Um, and that's really cool uh, that they fly at night and they actually show up on radar. Um, this is 
so you, I said there's a number of benefits um, for them flying at night. Um, in order to migrate at night, they tend to prefer clear and calm nights. Uh, tailwinds help, and usually weather is such during their migratory patterns that they're getting a tailwind. That's kind of why they migrate when they do. Um, but winds overall can't be too strong, or they'll set down on the ground. Now, this includes a lot of birds, all of our songbirds, even geese, things like that will migrate at night. In contrast, soaring birds, soaring birds like hawks and eagles, they fly during the day. And they actually use um, thermal, those warm air bubbles, if you will, that rise up from the ground they actually use them. And so they will um, spiral up inside of those warm air currents. And when they reach the top and the warm air runs out, they'll glide down till they find the next one and swirl back up. And oftentimes they do this as a group. Um, and so you can get these tremendous kettles, they're called, of swirling birds going up these thermals that you can't see as the person, um, but the birds know that they're there and they swirl up and then they glide down one by one and then they'll find the next one and swirl up. And for hawks, this allows them to fly incredible distances almost without having to flap their wings as long as the weather's good. Um, and it saves them a lot of energy on their migration to be able to just glide through as much of it as they possibly can. Other birds that migrate during the day are a lot of our blackbirds. So grackles, cowbirds, red-winged blackbirds, um, they actually migrate during the day as well. And one of the things that birds also sort of have to decide, if you will, is whether to go together as a flock or whether to go alone as a single bird. And a lot of us, when we think of migration, think of sort of this flock V formation of geese. This is snow geese um, in Delaware. Uh, Canada geese do this. Just about all geese do this. Um, this very, you know, typical line V formation of migrating birds. And other birds migrate um, in lines as well. These are scoters, a sea duck. Uh, uh, flying past the beach in Cape May, New Jersey. Um, they're in a long line, um, usually close to the surface of the water, although they can go quite high uh, if they choose to. So again, um, very flock oriented formation. Blackbirds form gigantic flocks, um, sometimes mixed species. So there could be grackles, red ring blackbirds and cowbirds in the flock. Um, these flocks are a little bit different. There doesn't ever really appear to be a leader like the lines of the geese or the ducks that we see. Um, they're more three-dimensional. So birds are sort of stacked on top of each other, underneath each other, beside each other. And that flock can get really tight and compact if a predator approaches. So if a falcon approaches and is trying to catch lunch, that flock will compress into a really tight format and fly very close together. Starlings do this as well. And so it's, again, just a unique adaptation. Um, the vast majority of the birds fly alone. And it's, it, the research on this is really mixed because some sources say they don't form flocks at all when they're flying at night. And others say, well, maybe they kind of do. I do know that there's sort of large, larger nebulous groups of birds, whether it's a true flock or those birds just sort of all happen to be flying in the same direction. Um, they don't seem to exhibit flock like behavior like these types of situations do that you see here. It's more just kind of like, oh, hey, you're up here too. Okay, well, we're all going towards Mexico. So let's just go together. Birds in that situation, a lot of the songbirds, um, they'll, there'll be a lot of space between each individual bird. They don't tend to fly very close together. And um, they do, one of the things though that they do no, do is they vocalize. Often one or two note calls, um, sometimes they may be different than any other call that they make. They only use it as like this migratory contact note. And it may not necessarily even be towards their own species. It may be like to other birds, hey, I'm here, don't run into me, kind of a thing. Um, but what's really cool is that if you go outside after sunset, particularly in the fall, 
but you can do it in the spring as well. Like I said, fall is just a much more protracted migration period. So it's a lot easier to sort of get it right uh, during that time. But if you go outside a couple hours after sunset on a fairly calm night in a quiet area, if you have a lot of road noise around you, it's hard to hear, but you can actually hear the chips and calls of the migrating birds flying overhead. Um, so I, I urge you to give it a chance uh, if you, if you, you know, get the opportunity uh, because it's really cool to actually, you know, sit there in the, in the dark basically and hear all these things flying over you. You might actually be able to see them fly across the face of a moon, the moon as well, if it's a full moon. Um, so encourage you to, to take a look. Don't panic. You don't have to know how to read a weather map, um, but weather does impact bird migration. And what we do know is that um, bird migration routes generally tend to line up with prevailing winds in a given area. Um, and prevailing winds shift as the year changes. So um, this is just an example here of some, you know, the trade winds and um, sort of some of the prevailing winds that we have um, going across the, the face of the earth at any given time. But um, species that nest in the northern boreal forest, um, fall for them, fall winds tend to come from the northwest. So they're blowing towards the southeast. And that's giving those birds a tailwind to sort of move them in the direction that they need to go. And that's what they like. Um, winds are a little bit opposite coming out of uh, South America and Central America in the spring. And again, it's the idea is they're using those winds to have a tailwind um, to move them back north. Weather can play a huge role. Um, this, you know, we see these, these blue lines with sort of these jagged teeth on them. These are cold fronts. Um, the H stands for a high pressure system. And hawk watchers know that the best migration conditions for hawks typically is the day of and up to about two days after the arrival of that high pressure system and cold front coming through um, from the Northwest towards where we would be watching them here uh, in Pennsylvania. And we know that days with high southeast winds, so winds sort of coming off the ocean, if you will, um, birds don't fly, hawks don't fly. They don't like that wind. It doesn't, it makes them work too hard. So they just stay wherever they are. So we like these cold fronts coming through. And to understand how weather impacts migration can help you as a birder um, or somebody interested in seeing some of these species of birds, if you know when they might be there. And I have more on that at the end because you don't actually have to learn how to read a weather map anymore. Um, you used to have to. Um, but so birds can be helped or hindered by the weather. Strong winds of any kind can make it difficult, especially for small birds to fly and especially strong headwinds. Um, they'll stay down. They may stay where they are for a longer period of time uh, until they get the right conditions to, you know, take off and complete the next leg of their journey. And so what happens is, and this can happen very often in the spring, we'll see reports that, you know, bird migration is really good down along the Gulf Coast and sort of maybe up into the Carolinas a little bit. And you think, oh, great, you know, those birds are going to be here. And then what happens is that big flush sort of gets stuck there for a day or so because of some bad weather. And then the next thing you know, all those birds are in New York and they just fly right over Pennsylvania. And so it takes sort of a little bit of luck, if you will, um, especially in the spring to see some of those species because they can just fly right over our region, uh, depending on the weather, to get to their breeding grounds further north. Uh, and, and I said in the fall, it's more protracted, they're a lot more leisurely. And so it's oftentimes much easier to see them if you're interested in that. So the other thing they have to think about is how fast, how high, and for how long. And this is really species specific, um, but it also kind of does depend on the route and the weather at any given time. But in general, most birds fly actually between about 25 to 35 miles an hour. You can see there's some variation um, in species. A lot of these birds are migrating over the water for a lot of the time. Um, they Birds that nest in parts of Canada uh, may actually migrate to the coast and then actually fly along out over the ocean on their way further south. Um, some, a lot of these birds like the, the white-throated sparrow, um, you know, they're coming over land. A lot of these other birds as well. Hawks are generally over land as well. So you can see there's some variation 
um, and it, some of it depends on the study. In terms of altitude, most birds on any given day don't fly much higher than about 500 feet off the ground. During migration, they can get much higher, um, 2,000 to 5,000 feet in elevation. Um, they don't always fly that high. And again, some of it depends on the weather. If there's high clouds, they might try to go over them. If it's a clear day, they might stay a little bit lower. Um, it kind of depends on the weather. But in general, during uh, migration, they'll fly higher than they normally do. And for how long they have to fly? Well, again, we saw, you know, the, the uh, red knot flies out over the open ocean um, for a period of time. Um, black pole warblers do the same thing. So an even much smaller bird uh, than the red knot breeds in the boreal forest. Um, in the spring, it migrates from its wintering grounds in South America uh, through Florida and up and spreads out uh, across the United States. In the fall, it does open ocean. Um, now this shows it taking off from up high up in New England. In fact, these birds are relatively easy to see in our area uh, and into New Jersey in the fall. So it may not be going quite as far as a bird that's leaving from, you know, up in Vermont and New Hampshire, but they can leave from up there. Um, and they fly over the open ocean all the way down to their wintering grounds. This journey takes 80 to 90 hours nonstop. It's about 2,300 miles. So you can see why it's really important for those birds to put on fat before they leave. Uh, if they do a short hop to a stopover point along the coast, they need that place to be full of food um, for them to you know, get the fat they need um, and continue on their journey. Um, most birds, if they're flying, you know, 25 miles an hour for eight hours, they're going to go 200 miles. So, you know, not tremendous distances. Um, and unless they're open over open water, most birds will put down um, when the sun comes up. If they're over open water, for obvious reasons, they'll keep going uh, until they can reach land. Um, so for the black pole warbler, researchers have concluded that this flight, the fall migration specifically, requires a specific degree of exertion that's not matched by any other vertebrate animal. In man, so in humans, the metabolic equivalent would be to run a four minute mile for 80 hours. Um, if a black pole warbler were burning gasoline instead of the fat that it has in its body, it would be getting 720,000 miles to the gallon, um, given its size. So, you know, it's a pretty incredible journey and they do it every year. Um, so totally fantastic. I want to mention really quick, because there's another kind, we talked about obligate migrants, those who have to migrate. And we talked about facultative migrants, those that don't have to. And eruptive migrants is facultative migrants that come in large numbers sometimes. Um, these birds typically don't move unless they have to. Um, so these are birds that breed further north up into Canada and the boreal forest, uh, up into the Arctic, the snowy owls. And all of these species and a couple of others can be seen in our area in eruptive years, sometimes in great numbers. Um, this past fall was an eruption of pine siskins. Uh, this is a bird that I haven't literally haven't seen in years and there were 25 of them in the arborvitae trees at the back of my property eating pine cones every day for a week. Um, it was utterly amazing and astounding. Common red poles. I took this picture in Minnesota when I was living there. They're fairly common winter birds there. Um, but for us here in Pennsylvania, we only see them in eruptive years. And there's a few of them that have been floating around lately. So this was kind of an eruptive year for uh, all of these species except the snowy owl. There were a lot of purple finches in the area. There were a lot of red-breasted nuthatches. And the reason that these birds move when they do and why they move in these massive numbers that they do is usually because there's some disruption in their food source. So the finches, the nuthatches, the siskins, and the red poles, and a couple of the other species all eat, basically in the winter, they're eating pine cones. And if the pine cone crop isn't very good, 
in the parts of Canada where they are, they'll move and they tend to move in large numbers to find food, which is why we see big flocks of them when they're here. Snowy owls are a little bit different. Snowy owls move when there's a, an abundance of their food source, which is lemmings. Um, that abundance during the breeding season allows female snowy owls to lay more eggs. Therefore, there are more baby snowy owls. And when there's those massive numbers of lemmings, um, snowy owls can start laying up to 10 eggs because they have food to feed them all. And when that happens, then there'll be this sort of massive dispersion and migration of the snowy owls for the winter uh, before they go back to the breeding season. And in that case, there can be multiple snowy owls in this area. In most winters, there's usually only about one or two um, that are seen you know, somewhat regularly. And the Jersey coast is usually the best place to see them. Um, there have been a couple this winter. I haven't seen one yet, um, but there's not huge numbers of them around. But these other four birds have all been in the area uh, this winter, which means that like for the purple finches and the pine siskins and even the common red poles, we probably won't see them for several more years because um, a lot of the, the pine cones um, and the lemmings kind of go in cycles. And so, you know, they'll be really good for a year and then they'll crash or the lemmings will be, you know, fairly normal levels and then they'll just have a population explosion and then the snowy owls have a population explosion. Um, so, yeah, so again, um, paying attention to uh, some of the birds, you may see birds you've never seen before uh, in an eruptive year and but if they don't have to, these birds won't migrate. Um, but obviously they're clearly capable of it. It's wired into their systems if they need to. So let's talk for a second about migratory barriers. Um, and there's a few of these, and we've talked about some of them already, but one big one for a lot of birds is, well, major metropolitan regions in general. And there's two reasons why, um, lights and high buildings. <laughs> and usually the high buildings have lights in glass windows. And so that creates um, confusion, disorientation for the birds, especially if it's foggy uh, or there's low clouds. Those kinds of things um, can cause massive numbers of birds to collide with buildings um, on migration. There's a number of um, campaigns out there uh, in local regions um, for what we call lights out. So um, there's a system I'm going to show you at the end uh, that uses that researchers can predict when migration is going to be high. And a lot of uh, cities and towns are starting to look at that and say, oh, you know, it's going to be a high migra migratory uh, path in the next couple of days over our city. We need to put out the word that people need to turn their lights out um, so that those birds can migrate over safely. Uh, and so that's actually a really cool thing that's come out of some of the research that's happened. Um, and if you live in areas that don't do lights out campaigns, um, I encourage you to talk to some of the people in your local government and see if that's something that could maybe be instituted. Um, and if you're interested, I can certainly um, get you some more information on that. Um, other man-made structures like windmills and cell phone towers, anything that sticks up into the air like that can be a hazard for a bird flying, especially at night when it can't see what's going on. Um, efforts are being made sometimes <laughs> to try to put these structures away from major routes that are known um, for birds, but that's not always the case. Uh, we know that, you know, the East Coast and particularly along the Jersey coast has a lot of migratory birds that move through there every year. Um, and there are still windmills in that area. So, in, and they're, they're, they want there to be more. So again, it's a balancing act. Um, you know, we need to look for alternative energy sources, but wind has its downfalls uh, as well. So something that we need to take into consideration uh, when we're looking for some of those kinds of things uh, because they can impact the birds. Uh, large bodies of water, we already said some birds fly over them, just no problem. Other birds will have to backtrack and find the long way around because they just won't go over the open water. Um, a lot of the hawks will actually migrate um, through Mexico. They don't like to fly over the Gulf of Mexico, the songbirds will, but a lot of the hawks go down straight into Mexico uh, and you can see their numbers just increase over um, 
the fall, you know, into Central America, and it, they literally call it the River of Raptors because there's a couple points along there uh, where you can literally sit on roofs of buildings and just watch thousands of hawks and turkey vultures flying over your head um, because they all sort of come through that bottleneck of land. Storms, uh, we talked a little bit about the weather, but obviously storms and rain can impact um, migration and make it difficult. They can cause catastrophic losses of birds if they happen, um, if a major storm happens when a lot of birds are out over the Gulf of Mexico, for example, and over open water. Um, birds will land on whatever they can. They will land on oil rigs, they will land on boats. Um, there are some small tiny islands out there that can be um, migratory havens for some of the birds uh, that just can't make it uh, because of the weather. So again, uh, most birds will try to avoid storms, but sometimes they can't and they can cause major problems um, for populations. And then I, I put a desert in here and Yes, deserts in and of themselves, just like large bodies of water can be a problem, but I actually mean this to sort of represent uh, the lack of resources. So we've talked a little bit tonight about stopover points for these birds and how a lot of these birds do kind of short hops, maybe a couple hundred miles uh, a night uh, as they're moving towards their uh, wintering grounds or moving back. And so it's really important that we have a healthy stopover habitat for them. So at Wissick and Trails, that's one of the things that we try to do. We're trying to improve the properties that we're managing for the birds that are breeding there, but we're also trying to improve it by making sure that we have a variety of native berries that bloom in the fall or that make berries in the fall for migrating birds as they're you know stopping over and building up their fat stores um, trying to make sure that we have a variety of uh, native trees and flowers that you know make nectar uh, make pollen early make um, berries if possible those usually they're not until later in the season but whatever we can do to provide food for those birds as they're moving through our region either north or south um, is something and that's something that you can do in your own yards planting native plants um, can make your yard a migratory haven um, for birds even if you live in a rare very sort of urban area um, there are things that you can do that will help um, that stopover habitat and encouraging you know your local communities to plant native plants whenever they can if you have a community garden area or community open space um, make sure those landscaping plans use native plants because that's all going to be beneficial to those birds that are flying through the region so i want to we're wrapping up here i just have a couple of more things so one of the things so I haven't really addressed this and I do want to talk about why migrate. I mean, we've said it's, you know, built into the birds and that's, that's true. They do, but why? Um, and we've seen that migration is hard. It's physically a lot of work to fly several thousand miles one way and then back again in a couple months. Um, it's treacherous. It's got a lot of hazards along the way, open water. There's predators when you, you know, land in areas you think are safe there's uh, lack of food there's just there's glass there's storms there's all this stuff so why why do birds do it well simply put in spite of all the risks that exist and and those do seem like pretty big risks in my mind it works um and it's worked for a long time for these birds since a lot of these reasons are not easily communicated in pictures and I didn't want to fill the slide with text. Um, I'm going to give you some photos of the migrants that come through our area uh, and I'm going to explain why birds migrate. So enjoy the pictures. I can talk through in a second with what birds these are if you're not familiar with them. But basically all of these birds are flying somewhere south of us for the winter and returning to our area or areas further north for their breeding. And we have some specific characteristics of our northern summers that really allow for breeding success of birds. Um, we have this synchronized insect emergence that happens as spring moves across our country, um, usually from south to north, that provides ample food for feeding birds along their migratory route, but then also feeds nestlings when they um, are hatched. We have long summer day lengths, especially at the more northern latitudes like the boreal forest and into the Arctic tundra. Um, 
there's more time to feed and a shorter time for birds to fledge because they're being fed more often, they can grow faster. So they often don't take as long in the nest as uh, birds that are more southerly uh, in their breeding grounds. And this also allows for birds to sometimes have two broods of chicks, sometimes even three. So they have a really high offspring yield um, for the risks that they take of migration. Now, obviously, you know, there's a downside to, to this northern climate, and that's northern winters with ice and snow and little to no insect activity. So the birds move south. But then you think, well, okay, if they're in the tropics, why don't they just stay in the tropics? It's the tropics, right? Um, it's sunny, it's warm, they don't have to worry about winter ever. But there's actually a lot of problems in the tropics and if you're a bird in terms of your ability to successfully raise chicks. Um, there's a lot more predators, snakes, monkeys, a lot of insects that will steal, that are big enough to steal uh, either eat eggs or steal baby chicks uh, when they're little. So there's a lot more predators that they don't have to deal with uh, in this part, of, even in our part of the country. Um, snakes can be a little bit of a problem, but not as many as in the tropics, for sure. Uh, there's no predictable insect flush. There's a lot of insects in the tropics, for sure. And there's a lot of insect diversity. But because they sort of don't all come out at the same time, like they do when our spring and summer happens here, they're harder to find, even though there's a lot of them. And the birds have to work a lot harder if they're feeding insect material to their nestlings. Um, the density of caterpillars is actually higher in, in northern latitudes in the spring and summer because of that you know, synchronized um, uh, appearance of those insects and sort of all coming out at the same time. Um, the day length is only about 12 hours a day. In the boreal forest, it can be 20 hours in the summer. So there's a lot more time for feeding, for growing, um, and all of those kinds of things so that they can uh, make more babies more frequently. And in most tropic species, because of some of these limitations, tend to lay very small clutches of eggs maybe only two for a lot of the birds. They only lay two eggs. Uh, in, in our temperate zone here, it's an average of four to six across a variety of species. So you see there's a lot more opportunity for them to um, pass on their genetic legacy, which is really what is their biological imperative. And it is a trade-off for sure. Um, you know, obviously there's a downside to migration and it can be challenging, but birds have handled, evolved to handle that very well. Obviously they get to where they need to go and it works. Um, somebody probably should have told the 22 robins at my bird bath this afternoon in the eight inches of snow that this was not the winter to stay further north. Um, but, you know, they'll survive um, as long as they can find food. And robins are another one of those species. If they can't find it, they'll move until they can. So um, they'll probably do okay. Before I hop off this slide, I'm just going to um, go through. I didn't want to put the names on all of these because it would be really confusing. But for people who might not be familiar with some of these species, um, I'm going to start over here in the left hand corner black, and go across the row. Um, black throated blue warbler, uh, black throated green warbler, uh, wood thrush, this actually breeds in our area, um, golden crown kinglet, magnolia warbler. The long one over here on the end is a um, Yellow-billed cuckoo also breeds in our area. I'm going to go back over to the right side. Uh, Northern Perula, a warbler that might breed in our area. We're kind of right at the boundary of its um, range for breeding. Uh, next one is a white-eyed vireo. Uh, don't usually tend to breed right where we are in Pennsylvania, but do breed uh, in New Jersey. They like slightly different habitats than we have. So kind of breed in sort of this general broader area. Red-winged blackbird breeds um, in our area on some of our preserved land even. Um, harlequin ducks, total migrant. Um, they're here only in the winter and then they go further back north um, to breed. Hopping all the way back over to the right, chestnut-sided warbler doesn't breed here, um, just migrates through. Ruddy turnstone migrates along with the uh, um, red knots, uh, population of them uh, they actually might breed along the Jersey coast. I'm not sure. No, they breed up in, in uh, the Arctic, but 
there's almost always ready turnstones all year round um, for the most part in parts of New Jersey. Uh, and we're going to talk about that sort of synchronous, dissynchronous uh, migratory patterns of some birds. Uh, but they winter here, they're here in the spring, um, and there's only a very short period of time where you can't find one um, in the state, in New Jersey. Uh, palm warbler, these guys migrate through uh, spring and fall. Um, blue grosbeak uh, don't typically nest right here, but not too far from where we are, um, they'll nest. And long-tailed duck, again, like the harlequin ducks, uh, a migrant to our area, um, typically only seen in the winter. So one of the things about migration, and you may not realize this if you're not a birder, and even as a beginning birder, I didn't realize this, but migration happens all the time. And I know I've talked a lot today about spring and fall, and those are definitely the peaks of migration uh, in our area. But given where we live and how birds move and the climate that we have right here, we basically have migration happening every month of every year. So for example, uh, if we start sort of in December as the beginning of the year, December to January is often when rough lake hawks will migrate here and snowy owls. Conditions have either gotten too bad for them where they were wintering and so they're moving. Um, they just, they don't need to leave, you know, where they are earlier than this. They're bred for being in the snow and the cold, so it has to be really bad to push them down here. Sometimes they just wander, but this is typically when they show up. February, red-winged blackbirds, cowbirds, and grackles start moving. Uh, and there are already red-winged blackbirds and some cowbirds on the move. People have been reporting red-winged blackbirds at the bird feeders um, recently, and especially this week in the snow. Um, they're here. And so, again, you know, we don't have to wait until spring uh, to see them. March, robins start moving back north. Uh, Eastern Phoebe start moving. Woodcocks migrate, and ducks that were here for the winter start moving back further north um, towards their breeding season. April to May, definitely peak northern migration. And the composition of the species changes over that time. There are some really early April migrants. There are some very late May migrants. And so it's just, it's a combination of things. Um, and it happens sort of, you know, throughout those two months. June to August, which is really sort of the breeding season for our birds here. Um, songbird migrations, not really happening very much, but shorebirds, because they moved through in April and have a very short period of breeding in their breeding grounds in the Arctic tundra, shorebirds actually start south. And shorebirds have evolved such that their chicks are born sort of ready to go. They're small, they need to grow, but they don't have to grow feathers. They already have their feathers. They're like, they run right out of the nest, they don't need a lot of time to develop. Um, and this is an adaptation that they have. And so what happens is um, birds will move north to breed, adults will breed. Um, they leave the chicks there and the adults will start south during the summer and the chicks will feed themselves and follow you know, later into the fall. So shorebirds start moving south and offshore seabirds um, sometimes move north. So a lot of the things like um, Jaegers and some of the real offshore birds actually move north into, um, like the whales do, into areas that have uh, more food in the summertime in terms of the open ocean. And then September and October, we're back to peak southward migration. And then into November, the ducks start arriving here. And that's when we usually start seeing eruptive species arrive. So really, there's migration happening here all the time. Uh, you just have to know what you're looking for. And let me tell you, it's really nice to know that, like, for example, on a day like today, when it's really snowy outside, the red-winged blackbirds are moving, spring's not that far away. Um, and the birds are already starting to come back. So I told you I talked really quick about using weather to predict migration. You used to have to know how to read a map like this to be able to use weather maps to help you understand where to find birds on migration. Thankfully, from the fine folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, you don't have to do that anymore. There is a website called BirdCast, B-I-R-D-C-A-S-T, BirdCast, that during the migration seasons of spring and fall, so it's, it's, you can see the website now, but it's not active because there's not really that level of migration. They do this during the spring and they do it during the fall. 
they actually use eber data and they use weather data and they mash it all together and they predict where the highest levels of migration are going to be across the united states during spring migration and during fall migration and it's really cool so basically instead of knowing how to read this kind of weather map all you have to do is look for the bright spots on their maps um, the white you know, white out areas are the levels of high migratory intensity um, for that night. And so this gives you a couple of opportunities. Uh, you can um, use this as an opportunity to know when to go outside and listen for birds um, that might, you know, when there might be a lot of birds coming through your area. So that couple of hours after sunset, if you're, you know, in one of these really white spots, Go stand outside and listen. See if you can see any of the birds cross the face of the moon. See if you can hear them. And you can use this to help you. If you're a birder and want to see those birds on the ground, this gives you an opportunity of where you might want to look the next day. Again, most birds are sort of taking a couple hundred mile hops um, for the most part. Now, you can't completely predict that always, uh, but you can kind of get an idea of where they might be the next day uh, if you want to try to go see them locally. The other thing that they do is they have a radar map that they use to show. Now, I just, I grabbed this off of their, the yellow line is sunrise and sunset, red will be sunset. Um, they, they do this and they put weather um, forecasts on here. It's not active right now, like I said, because there's not actually migration. I just had to grab this, but they do show sort of where, which direction the birds are moving in and they'll show storms on there. And that can be really helpful because birds will set down when it starts raining. So if you're in an area that where the rain is gonna happen at like two in the morning, that will often force the migrating birds down. And so then the next day will be a great day to go out and look for them. So you can use this combination of tools um, to sort of help you find the birds and understand what's going on uh, if that's something that you know, you're interested in doing. And I think it's just really cool to know sort of where the birds are and where they're going to be um, on any given night um, during migration and how many birds are moving um, as well, because this sort of takes that into account as well. So last slide, um, I wanted to mention real quick monarchs and other insects. So I mentioned earlier that insects migrate like the dragonflies and the monarch butterflies and a number of other butterfly species migrate as well. Monarchs are the ones sort of with all the glory, if you will, because of their very long migration to Mexico. And basically the entire eastern population of monarch butterflies migrates to the same 11 to 12 mountaintops in Mexico um, in September and October. Um, like, unlike the birds, um, the monarchs that return to our area are not the same monarchs that left our area. This is true for other insects as well, like the dragonflies. They migrate south. They stay there for a period of time. In the case of the monarchs, it's the entire winter that they spend on top of these mountains in Mexico. You can see here, uh, you can actually see them from the sky. All that orange is monarch butterflies in, hanging in the trees. Um, they move a little bit further north into Texas as the milkweed starts growing in the spring. They breed, they lay eggs, and they die. Their offspring move a little bit further north, same thing they breed, they die. Their offspring move a little bit further north. So by the time the monarchs get back to us, in usually in mid-June, it's somewhat weather dependent, um, we could be the great, great grandchildren or the great, great, great grandchildren, um, depending on how the migration has gone that summer, of the butterflies that migrated the year before. So again, totally different strategy than birds. Birds, the birds that migrate are the birds that come back. Um, and monarchs and other insects, the dragonflies do this as well. They dry, they move further south, Carolinas, along the Gulf Coast. Um, they will breed. The dragonflies that migrated will not be the ones that return. It will be their offspring. Because monarchs are a little bit easier to study than birds are, we know a little bit more about the systems that they use to navigate. And this is a very complicated picture and I'm gonna simplify it um, very much. Basically, they need um, sun signals both in their eye, which is here in the main retina, and in their antenna. They have 
sensors in their eye and the sensors in the antenna work together um, to understand where the sun is, which helps keep them on course. Um, in addition, they have a um, they also have a magnetic orientation system that allows them to migrate on cloudy days uh, as well and also you know senses the earth magnetic system like the birds do um, to keep them moving in the right direction monarch migration interestingly enough shows a lot of similarity to hawk migration in the fall they tend to congregate in the same areas they use a lot of the sort of the same thermals that hawks use so they congregate in areas like cape may um, and along mountain fronts um, mountain lines, leading lines in, in the mountains and sort of funnels them down um, towards the south because they use that warming air that's coming off of those ridges just like the hawks do. And just like birds, we still do not completely understand how they go and find the same sites every year. And especially in monarchs when the butterflies that will be leaving Pennsylvania and flying to Mexico this coming September are not the butterflies that flew there last September. And they're several generations removed. Um, again, hardwired into their systems, but quite remarkable. And you know how they can use the systems that they have to end up in the same 11 or 12 mountaintops every year. And just like the birds, how do they go exactly where they you know, need to be um, for migration or for wintering? And likewise, how do they come back? You may or may not be familiar with the fact that the Wissahickon Trails has a summer um, bird banding um, project that we have going on and we have banded some gray cat birds every single year or we've captured the same bird every single year. Uh, we've been doing it for a little over five years now and the same birds are coming back. So this bird was here in the summer, migrated to Florida, came back to the same little patch of woods at Crossways Preserve. Um, to breed and raise its young and then left again in the fall. And it's kind of amazing when you think about it. And that bird's not going a tremendous distance, but still the fact that it returns to our little patch of woods every year uh, to raise its babies is really kind of cool. And how it knows to do that is still a mystery. Um, but I hope tonight I've given you a little bit better picture of understanding migration. And I'm going to answer questions. I did want to point out, um, this email or website down here at the bottom, the eBird, this status and trends, this is where those animations of the different species are. And they have a whole bunch of different species in there. So again, if it's something you're interested in, I encourage you to go take a look uh, and see some of the other species that they've um, put the animations for um, their you know, relative abundance and sort of gives you an idea of their migration map, if you will. Some upcoming events here to note, again, all on our website um, for registration. And I did see a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna answer those now. Um, go back up, whoops, go back up here to the beginning. Okay, so somebody asked, where do you see them in the Delaware Bay? Um, the easiest place to see them is a place, um, oh great, now I'm gonna draw a complete blank. Hold that thought. Who's winning the battle over horseshoe crabs, fishermen, or conservationists? Well, <laughs> it's kind of a draw right now, I'm going to say. I think overall, I think sort of the conservationists. Um, there's a lot of issues still. Um, and one of the main issues actually really has to do more with um, the taking the the um, taking the crabs for their blood. They're not killed when they do that. They often take them and take their blood and then release them just like we would give blood. But there are concerns that that's um, still not really good for them and looking at alternatives. Um, the problem is, is that the properties of their blood are rather unique and it's difficult to find alternatives that are artificial or uh, uh, artificial is not the right word, um, synthetic. And so um, that is still an ongoing issue. Overall, the take of crabs for just using them for bait, um, that's gone way down. Um, the birds still are not on the rebound, um, but as I said, there may be other factors involved, either 
uh, dealing with their breeding grounds or dealing with their wintering grounds that may also have an impact. Uh, what happens if the birds do not sufficiently fatten up? Do they still attempt migration or what? Yes, generally they will. Um, they may start out hoping that they will uh, catch up somewhere down the road uh, and they may simply exhaust themselves and starve. Uh, most if they burn through the fat reserve that they have, they will actually start using their muscles to create energy. So it puts them into a real deficit um, because if they start using the muscles, then they don't have the muscles that they need to fly and it just, it becomes a very vicious cycle. Uh, so it is really important that they have the opportunity um, to fatten up. And if they can't do it where they're starting, then hopefully they have the opportunity to do it someplace um, in the middle. But that biological imperative to migrate generally overrides that. And yes, they will still start out if there's not if they don't sufficiently fatten up enough somewhere along the way, they probably won't survive migration. Um, so that is another risk. Uh, is there any evidence that some species of birds are adapting to climate change or is climate change happening too fast for most birds to adapt? Right now, we're probably in the it's too fast for most birds to adapt kind of phase for the vast majority of our birds. Um, I run a uh, community science project. That's part of a larger project uh, that a researcher from North Carolina does called Caterpillars Count. And if you're interested in participating in this, once I tell you about it, please send me an email because I will be looking for people this summer to help us out. Um, it is socially distanced. You can do it all on your own. I'll be doing virtual training. So um, regardless of what happens with COVID and vaccinations and all that kind of stuff, you could help do this if you're interested. The idea is that birds need caterpillars and birds need caterpillars to feed their babies. And this study actually has volunteers going out to trees that I've marked and whacking the branches and looking for the caterpillars that fall off, catching them on a sheet, um, taking pictures of them, counting them and putting them back on the tree or even on the ground underneath because they'll crawl back up so that the researcher is looking at sort of when caterpillars are peaking and when migration is peaking. And already from the somewhat limited data that he has for a couple of years of the study, it seems that the caterpillars are coming out much earlier than they used to. And a bird like he uses the scarlet tanager as his example, its migration is still a couple of weeks behind that peak of caterpillar uh, emergence. So they haven't quite caught up to each other. Most birds can adapt fairly quickly. That's one of the reasons why we use them for a lot of studies related to climate type issues and habitat issues because they are fairly responsive. Migration changes can take a couple of generations, but we may see some of those birds starting to catch up um, if you know this early spring and the peak of caterpillars continues to be earlier. Uh, we may see that change a little bit. Oh, somebody, okay, somebody mentions that they are recently seeing two pileated woodpeckers in uh, specifically the Gwendon Preserve in the backyard and not and in previous years haven't seen them. What if anything has changed for the pileated woodpecker? Um, not really anything. They have wide ranges. They have bigger ranges than just about any other woodpeckers. And there's just not as many of them. So they're not as commonly seen. Uh, and it could just be this year they're moving a little bit more. We've seen them in almond trout and there's been some at four mills um, quite frequently as well. So I just think that they may be particularly active. I don't really think there's anything um, going on in terms of the population changing um, per se uh, for those birds. They Sometimes they're there and, and seen and other times they're not. Um, Sorry, I think my computer just like went to sleep here. Whoops. All right, hold on one second. Uh, I lost the questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and where'd my chat go? Cause I lost my questions. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, somebody says big flock of red winged blackbirds. Yeah, <laughs> blackbirds and grackles obliterating suet cakes. Yep, that's what happens. Um, let me hold on one second because I need to answer the question about where to see 
Reed's Beach. <laughs> Reed's Beach is the place to see the um, red knots. And there's also a couple of other places along the Delaware Bay Shore. If you go to um, Cape May Bird Observatory's website or New Jersey Audubon website, you can find um, a Delaware Bay Shore birding map and butterfly map is what they call it. It's online and it has all of the sites um, located there. Uh, and that can be really helpful for finding some of those species a lot like the shorebirds that we just don't have as many of right here because we don't have that kind of habitat. Um, so that can be really helpful for that. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. I'm not seeing any other questions. So again, um, thank you for joining us tonight. Sorry, this went a little bit longer than I planned to. Um, this is what happens when there's so much to talk about. Um, if you have any questions that hit you afterwards, please feel free to shoot me an email and um, I'm happy to answer them. If you're looking for specific birding locales, again, please shoot me an email uh, and I will do whatever I can um, to help. So thanks for joining us and hope we'll see you next time.